on, be upstanding this morning. We're going we're gonna to trust the Lord for His presence to manifest in a unique way. And we realize that this is the day that Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Come on, lift up your hands to God this morning and ask the Lord for a fresh anointing that you did not come here in vain. We don't just show up in church because it's Sunday, but that we trust the Lord that He wants to do a fresh work in our lives. He's a God of signs and wonders. Amen. He's a God of miracles. He's a God who wants to set us free. He's a God who answers prayer. So this morning, just lift up, lift up your hands and talk to Him. Talk to Him. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank You. We thank You for all Your works the good works that you have done for us, the good things that we can look to and look forward, Father, even for the greater blessings and the work that you have spoken of in many different ways over our lives, over our nation. We trust that you will complete your work. You who have begun a good work in us will surely complete it in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we just trust even for the word this morning that you'll speak to hearts. Open up your, the hearts of your people to the word that will generate life and peace and joy and liberate us, Lord God, in your will. And we trust that you will accomplish your plan in our lives. So, Lord, we commit the rest of the time into your mighty hands. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So, you might be wondering what is this? Uh, I've got, ah, it, wow, this is really slippery. I've got several messages here. Is there a table? That it, oh, no, it's okay, it doesn't matter. These are messages, audio messages that uh, are now in USB form, right? So you, you have a USB portal, you can just plug it in, in your car, in your journeys while you're driving. Uh, you can plug into your computer and you can receive messages that you can be enriched by. So these are messages of faith, messages that has uh, transformed my life and wherever I have gone, I've ministered uh, these messages into many different congregations and I've seen uh, wonderful results from it. So there are different titles, okay? So there are two-part messages and there are four-part messages. So this is a two-part message. It's how to adapt well to change. Okay, so a two-part message is 15 ringgit. Okay, so this one is for those who are going through changes in life. If you are about to transition in your life, this is a very good message to help you to make that transition. How to adapt well in life. And then we have a two-part message, how to live a worry-free life. Do you think it's possible? Living a worry-free life. It's possible. Jesus spoke about living worry-free. And so this is taken from the text that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6. And this is also uh, going to help you. So it's a two-part message, 15 ringgit. And then this one is touching heaven, changing earth. A touch on two different aspects what a Christian or a church needs to adapt in their lives. So if you're a Christian and if you want your church to really progress and move forward, this is a good message because this, this will help us build the two pillars of our Christian faith. Touching heaven, changing earth. And then we have, this as well is very popular, overcoming your greatest fears. This is two part. 15 ringgit as well. Overcoming your greatest fears. So if you're battling with any form of fear, this will help you overcome it. All right? So, and then we have the four part message. The four part message is uh, uh, your new identity. All right, so this is your born-again experience and what has happened and transpired and how you can move on to live that new identity that God has planned for your life. And this, will, this is a life changer as well. Your new identity is four parts, so it's 30 ringgit. And then we have the faith classics. Now, if you know, my ministry is basically based on faith and the messages that God has given me to encourage, to spur the hearts of people, the message of faith. So these are four classic messages that I've preached throughout my ministry. So this is, um, this is also very uh, stirring and uplifting. So this is 30 ringgit, four-part message. 
All right, so these are the messages that are out, out there. I hope you take advantage of it. And it's going to benefit you. It's going to change your life. All right, so just leave it with the sister. She's going to be at the back there. So please do take advantage of it. This morning, I want to be talking about a subject that we have missed out many times in our Christian lives. You know that a Christian needs to exhibit love. Jesus talked about the greatest command. What's the greatest command? The greatest command in the new covenant is to love one another even as I have loved you. But we, we know this is the badge of Christianity. We know that peace is also a part of our Christian walk. But many don't know that joy is supposed to be a big part of our lives, joy. And it's sad that so many times you look at a Christian's life on your face, there's no joy. It's absent. In churches that you come, that I travel sometimes, you go in, you know, it's, it's, it, there's, there's the absence of joy. And this is not what Jesus is talking about. This is not the church that Jesus bought. This is not the Christian life that Jesus wants us to live. I want to talk to you about joy this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to this scripture that is in the Old Testament, but it's a phrase that every Hebrew, every Jew, every Israelite will understand and they'll connect this phrase to a specific moment in their life. So in your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Psalms. Let's turn to Psalm 89. Psalm 89 and we will read verse 15. It says, blessed are the people, notice this phrase here, who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. So how many of you know that joy affects our countenance? Amen? When you have joy, God's countenance shines on you. And when you have the joy of the Lord, it begins to show up in your countenance. So the phrase, the joyful sound, what is this all about? To the Jewish people, this is a moment when they would be accepted as a nation. In fact, that particular day is a feast day. The Jewish feast day of the Day of Atonement promises for one year of celebration. Hallelujah. If you go up to the book of Leviticus, you can find the occasion there and what the priests ought to do on this particular day. I'm talking about the high priests. It's a day of solemn assembly. In other words, it begins very early in the morning and, it, and the entire day, the congregation would be outside the temple in the outer courts. The temple of Israel, the temple of Solomon, the temple in Israel had different compartments. So the general, general public will be on the outside anticipating for this moment when they can rejoice as a nation. The priests, the high priests will do a lot of rituals. Offer animals, a bull, he would have garments that he would offer animals with. And the entire day was spent, you know, if you cut any, many of you will know if, you, if you're active in the kitchen, you'll know how long it takes to prepare and cut up these animals. He will be performing these rituals for the sake of the atonement. If he will, will successfully appear God, before God and offer this sacrifice for the people, if he would successfully make it outside of the temple. And that's when the people begin to applaud and shout. And this is what the psalmist is talking about here. So throughout the day, he makes sacrifices. He, he cuts this bull. He, 
he offers this sacrifice with, with garments, and then he'll take it off, he'll clean himself up before he enters the Holy of Holies. Everyone say the Holy of Holies. And that's the compartment only the high priest can enter. The Levites, the priests can only enter the holy place. So there's the outer courts, everyone say outer courts. And there's the holy place, everyone say holy place. And then there's the holy of holies, everyone say holy of holies. So once a year, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, the high priest will go into the holy of holies to make atonement for the people, not with garments that he has used earlier, that he has sweated in, he puts it all aside. He now is clothed with the high priestly garment that Moses commanded for the priests. And he goes in and he makes atonement for the people. Now, his garments had the tassels of it has bells. Has bells. So as long as the bells were ringing, everything is fine. Why? Because there's movement. Now, the, the priests could not enter the Holy of Holies. So what would they do? They would tie one of his legs with a rope. So he would go about be, uh, performing all of these rituals in the Holy of Holies. So as long as there was sound, it's fine. It's safe. The moment there was no sound, there was, they were really in trouble, dangerous. Why? Because he would have been struck dead by the glory of God. And so his task is to perform these rituals before God, making atonement for the, cow, for the tabernacle, for the people, for every other thing, for the nation. So he sprinkles the blood in the, in the uh, Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, and then he makes atonement for the people. And when God accepts that offering, he comes out and he presents himself before the people. Hallelujah. And this is what he's talking about here. The psalmist is talking about a moment when the nation rejoices. Hallelujah. But do you know it's only a temporary rejoicing? It's only a temporary rejoicing. Because every year, the scripture says that they would be reminded every year that these offerings had to be done for the atonement of the nation. So what do we call this? This, it, this is a, a short-lived joy. It's a short-lived joy. It's not something that is perpetual. And notice here that joy always comes with the absence of sorrow and pain. You can look it up in the scripture, scriptures. You can look it up in the Bible. Joy is a product of the absence of sorrow and pain. When David sinned, in the book of Psalms 51, Psalm 51 records David's prayer. It has got some classic statements that we have used for singing as well. Some of the songs that we sing in church, and one particular song has got these lyrics in it. <coughs> now let's turn to Psalm 51 for a moment. In Psalm 51, David pleads to God to once again restore his joy. He wants joy. Now what would happen, what would have to take place for joy to be restored in his life? Now I'm saying all of these things to tell you that we live in a better covenant. We live in a better time where joy does not have to be short-lived. It does not have to be short-circuited. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that people are seeking for joy or happiness, and it has to come from external circumstances. And I'm sure that many of us as well are seeking for joy and happiness, but we're going to the wrong sources. We're going to someone, we're going to some place, we're going to something to have this joy in our lives. 
So David was seeking for this joy that would come, and notice this phrase here, after salvation. So like I told you, a famous song that, is, that has these lyrics with it that we have often sung is what David penned in Psalm 51. Come on, turn, turn to your Bibles. Open up your Bibles and let's look at Psalm 51 and let's read verse 10. Notice he says here, Create in me a clean heart, O God. So now notice David had sinned. His heart is broken. He's seeking for that restoration of fellowship, of joy that only God can give. And so he says, Lord, and notice here, David wrote this not as a psalmist only, but even as a prophet. So David in the Old Testament occupied different offices, different positions. He was a psalmist. He, we know that he was a king. But very few know that he is a prophet. He was a prophet. So David operated in the office of a prophet as well. So notice when he wrote this in Psalm 51. Look in your Bibles. Psalm 51, when he wrote this, it could not have been for his time. So when he penned this, when he wrote this, he knew that this was or this has to be for a future generation. And do you know what? It's for you and I. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, what is this steadfast spirit? This steadfast spirit is a spirit that has been renewed, that has been made right with God. So that's why I said that David was praying for something beyond his time. It could not have happened in his generation. And then he said here in verse 12, verse 12, what did he say? Restore to me the joy of your salvation. So he's talking about a salvation that God would accomplish ultimately through Christ. Because every year those sacrifices in the old covenant could not take away sin. But notice here it says joy is a product of salvation. Joy comes after salvation. And joy, I want to link this up as well to verse 10, joy is a product of the new spirit. As long as the spirit is broken, as long as fellowship with God is broken, as long as the relationship with God is limited, there was no joy. The way David was praying for. So David prayed for God, I want this joy that comes with salvation. And it comes because of a recreated spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And notice the last phrase says, Uphold me by your generous spirit. So that's why it's very important for us to read different translations. So if you're a Bible reader and if you have different translations, it's very helpful. And it helps you to zoom into, it helps you to accurately interpret what certain words mean. So like I said, the, the word steadfast, the correct word, one of, a good, one of the good translations to have if you're into Bible study is the Amplified Bible. And the word steadfast there means righteous, right spirit. And like I told you, it could not have happened during David's time. And then again, this word generous. What's this word generous? Because again, let me tell you, it requires a proper interpretation. The word generous here is also translated willing and abundant. Willing and abundant. So let's put these words there. Uphold me with your generous, willing, abundant spirit. Again, let me tell you, 
This is not something for David's generation. So if you look at verse 11, what did he pray for? Verse 11, he prayed, Cast me or do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So this is what happened in the Old Testament. Not in the New Testament. Does God take away the Holy Spirit from you today? He doesn't. So that's why it has to be properly interpreted. So when it says here, generous spirit, this can again only happen to Christians, to everyone who has been recreated, renewed in Christ Jesus. So David's prayer basically has been answered through the sacrifice of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? And like I said, the word generous, let me just tell you, the, the corresponding word, because we know that the Old Testament was in Hebrew, the New Testament is in Greek. So the corresponding word for generous is from Psalm, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. So what does 2 Corinthians 9 7 says? Let each man give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. And then the last line says, for God loves, what does God love? A cheerful giver. That's the word generous there. Hallelujah. And notice how it, it's linked with joy. Amen. Hallelujah. So where's that spirit? Come on, where's that spirit today? Where's that cheerful spirit? It's on the inside. Amen. It's on the inside of us. You see, the thing is this, that joy is embedded. Joy is inside the heart of every Christian. Now, let me just put these scriptures together so that you can begin to see a wonderful picture. So we talked about the high priest. What the high priest did in Leviticus 16 was a reminder continual every year. So they had a shortcoming of joy, temporary short joy. But Jesus is our great high priest, amen? Hallelujah, Jesus. And the first thing that he did after he was raised from the dead, go to John's gospel. Turn to the gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, the first thing that happened after Jesus was raised from the dead, what did he do? He did not go and visit his disciples. This is a story that we find in the Gospels. We find in the Gospels on the first day of the week, he appeared to his disciples. But let me show you something here. Only the Gospel of John records in chapter 20, Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 17. So he tells Mary Magdalene, she was the first one who spotted Jesus after his resurrection. So what did he tell her? He said, I am ascending where? Come on, John 20 verse 17. I am ascending to my Father and to my God. So listen, the first thing that Jesus did after his resurrection was not to visit his disciples. What did he do? He went to appear before the Father. Hallelujah. So where do we get it in the, in the writings of the New Testament? Turn to the book of Hebrews. Turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. So it's very important for us to study the Bible and to realize that certain verses and occasions in the Bible fit certain times. So Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, the Bible tells us that he was raised with a glorified body. He was raised with a spiritual body. So he did all of those work of atonement in the natural on the cross. He gave himself as a sacrifice with his sinful body, or rather when sin was put upon him, what I mean by sinful is simply fleshly body, human flesh, 
fleshly body was put upon him, a sin was put upon him. He finished that task. God raised him from the dead and now he's clothed with a heavenly body. Hallelujah. Amen. So all of the things that has been stated in the past in the old covenant is actually a type, a typology, a figure of the New Testament. Jesus fulfilled it. So he enters heaven. He goes into the presence of God. He enters heaven and look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. The first thing that Jesus did after his resurrection, he enters heaven. He present, presents himself to the Father. The scripture says here, but Christ came as high priest. Verse 11. Of the good things to come, what things is he talking about? He's talking about the new covenant. What the old covenant could not do in that it was limited through its sacrifices and because of sin and has caused many to have a short-lived joy. But Christ came as high priest of the, new, of the good things to come, the new covenant. Notice here it says, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle. So this could not have happened on the earth. It could not have happened on the earth. It, 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 it says here, he entered a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of this creation. It says, not with blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Amen. Hallelujah. So Christ enters the holy of holies, the holy place where God's presence is in heaven, offering up his own blood. For what? It says here, he entered the most holy place. How often? How often? Come on. How often? Once and for all. Everyone say once and for all. Not like the priests of all that had to go in annually once a year on the Day of Atonement, but the scripture simply says that he entered the holy of holies once and for all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He enacts the new covenant. He seals it with his blood. The scripture says here that he has once for and for all entered the holy place having obtained eternal redemption. Amen. Eternal redemption. In other words, the blood of Jesus has sealed our faith. And the work of salvation is complete in that we today can experience freedom. Amen. Amen. Freedom. Hallelujah. And so notice here, when you study joy, joy is the absence of sorrow and pain, but joy brings the sound of freedom. Hallelujah. So that's why today as Christians, we must understand the terms, even in the old covenants where it speaks about a joyful sound. Hallelujah. It's the Christian that can experience that joy. Amen. It's the Christian that can experience God's countenance, favor, amen, upon our lives. We should be the most happiest people in all this world. Amen. We have been set free. We have been delivered. God shines his face upon us and we can experience favor all three along. Amen. So Jesus comes back sealing the new covenant and now this is a passage that we must get involved or get acquainted with because this is actually what happens and an answer to David's prayer in Psalm 51. The story in John chapter 4 and Jesus spoke to this woman at the well. So this woman was seeking for happiness. She came at the well and Jesus struck a conversation with her and he revealed to her the truth of salvation. She was at first skeptical. She was at first reluctant. 
to relate with Jesus. She wanted joy. She wanted this happiness. Jesus said, if you knew who is it that can give you this true joy in life, you will ask him. And then in John 4, 14, John 4, 14, Jesus revealed what actually happens when the Spirit of God comes into our life. So when you embrace, when I embrace, when a person embraces the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you say, Jesus is my Messiah, Jesus is my Lord, when you say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of my sins, when you say, Jesus, come into my life, this is actually, actually what happens. John 4, Jesus tells us in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water. Now, he equates water with the water of the well, the water that the world can give. Yes, there is happiness in this world. Yes, there is temporary, short-lived happiness in this world. We can have joy and happiness from the things of this world. But listen, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, amen, the water of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The water of abundant life. The water of spiritual life. The water that I shall give him, what happens? Will become in him. Amen. So that's why the prayer of David has been fulfilled. Create in me a clean heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Amen. That's an answered prayer. Hallelujah. He prayed also, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Listen, Jesus said, the water, the spirit that I will give you does not fade away, does not run dry. Amen. Because it becomes in you a generous supply. Hallelujah. Amen. A generous supply that is welling up. And listen, you can be a cheerful giver. Amen. You can be a one that is always welling up with his joy, with his life on the inside. Hallelujah. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain or a well springing up. You have something on the inside that is springing up. Another translation says bubbling with. Bubbling up with, bubbling up. And that's why, you know, when someone is so full of the Spirit, sometimes the, the Word of God bubbles up on the inside and they begin to utter it forth. What's that called? It's called a prophecy. Amen. So this is eternal life in that the Spirit of God is not given in a measure that God can give and God can take away. But when you accept Christ into your life, the Holy Spirit is given as a supply on the inside of you. Amen? Hallelujah. So the question arises now. Then why is it that Christians in, and many, in many Christians' lives, there is no joy? Amen? <laughs> when you talk to them, there's no joy in your lives. So let's go to the book of Isaiah to find out why that's the case. Isaiah chapter 12 to find out why is it that some Christians don't exhibit or don't release this joy in their lives. Isaiah 12 verse 3. It says, Therefore, come on, with joy, everyone say with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Let's pause there for a moment. Zion, the old covenant, foresaw, like David foresaw as a prophet of God, the day when there would be a well of salvation. But let me ask you this question. Where is this well of salvation today? Where is it? It's on the inside. Amen. It's on the inside of you and me. That's where the Spirit of God resides. That's where the supply is. The generous Spirit of God is on the inside of us. But listen, the scripture is still true today. What do we have to do? We have to draw from our lives. 
Amen. So are you seeing the fact here? You can have joy. You can have peace. You can have an abundant supply on the inside of your life, but sadly, you can live without it. You can live without it. If you don't draw up these things in your life. So come on, people of God. As Christians, we must learn how to draw these things up. Amen? Draw it up from your lives. If you want peace, you've got to draw it up from your lives. If you want joy, you've got to draw it up from your lives. If you want the love of God, you have to draw it up. Because God has abundantly supplied, generously supplied on the inside that well that is able to give and produce. Amen? So people of God, I'm, I want to talk to you today about how we can draw joy in our lives. How we can draw. So when you come to church, listen, you don't come to church empty-handed. Amen? What do you come to church with? You come to church with your bucket. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I'm not talking about a little bucket. Uh, next, next Sunday, Pastor, uh, Pastor don't get surprised. Some of them will bring pails to church. <laughs> no, I'm talking about a spiritual bucket. Amen? In other words, you've got, to draw, you've got to draw joy when you need joy. In fact, that was the question the woman at the well asked Jesus. She said, listen, where, how are you going to draw this living water out? You don't have a, a, a pail. Listen, we have or we need to have this bucket. We need to have this container. We need to have these tools in order to draw from the well of salvation. All right, so today I'm going to show you three different ways how you can have joy in your life. Amen. Do you want to know how you're going to have joy in your life? All right, number one, joy is found in the presence of God. In the presence of God. So listen, why are some Christians not experiencing joy when they realize that all they have to do is come into God's presence? Now let me just give you the scripture first. In Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. What does it say there? Listen, joy is found in the presence of God. Come on, let's say this together. Joy is found in the presence of God. Notice the second half says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So notice here, joy is an element that is present with God. So why is it that sometimes we don't have this joy? It's simply because you don't come into his presence. Now you can be in his presence, but still not have joy. Do you know that Christians today come to church, but they still have no joy. They come to church without joy, and they go back without joy. They come to church with sorrow and problems. They go back in sorrow and problems. Why? Because, listen, you need to come into God's presence. You need to get involved in God's presence. Amen. You see, the Word of God, and especially the book of Psalms, tells us how we ought to behave in God's presence. Come into His presence with Thanksgiving, come into his presence with singing. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout. You see, that's why people of God, Christians don't experience joy. Because you are not doing what the scripture tells us to do. If we want joy, we have to participate. We have to exercise. If you're just going to sit down and enjoy the performance of the worship leader and the team, you're not going to experience joy in your life. Now, this can be also done in your own home. 
in your own home, you can experience the same joy that we experience on Sunday. Amen. See, this is not something that we experience only on Sunday. Like I told you, joy is on the inside of us. Every Christian has that fountain of living water, but you've got to draw it out. Amen. So in your homes, even if you're alone in your home, you can get up in the morning with a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. You can begin to dance in the presence of God. And listen, in doing these things, you will begin to experience joy. Hallelujah. Amen. So listen, if you want joy, you have to shout for it. If you want joy, you got to clap your hands. You got to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. See, this is all in the scripture. This is all in the scripture. Amen. So where is joy again? In the presence of God. So what do you have to do? You have to get involved. You have to activate. I wrote that in my book, Activating Your Faith. Listen, you have to, you have to connect with these things. If you want to experience abundant life, if you want to experience the joy that the Bible talks about, in His presence is fullness of joy. Amen. The second thing about joy. The second thing about joy is in participation in fellowship. So where do we get that? Let's turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. Sorry, 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. 1 John chapter 1. Now John says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have what? Fellowship. And this is a very important word. Fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 4. The fourth verse says, These things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Amen. So listen, where does joy come from? Joy comes from fellowship. Hallelujah. Amen. Joy comes from fellowship. Listen, that's why it's so, so important for us as Christians. Listen, Christians, we need to have friends, right? We have friends out there in the workplace. We have friends out there in our neighborhood. If you're schooling, you have friends in the school, in college, and in every other place. Listen, friends can relate with you, especially if they're unbelievers, they can relate with you at a certain, at a certain uh, amount, at a certain level. But we need this fellowship of Christian brothers. So it's important that you have friends. Why? Because they can be your future church members. Amen. Future Christians who will come into the fellowship of God and the fellowship of God's people. But listen, we need to have fellowship with Christians because there is this fellowship that John talks about here that is not obtained in any other kind of relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's why also in the subject of marriage, it's very important that you marry in the Lord. When you try to marry someone who is not in the Lord, then that element of fellowship and intimacy is not found in that marriage. So this is all in the context of relationship. If you want joy, the joy that the Lord speaks about, the Bible speaks about, we will have to have fellowship, first of all, with God, amen, and then also with one another. So that's why those people who are not coming back to church for whatever your reason is, listen, you must make it a point. You can sit at home and, <laughs> and fellowship with the four walls, but listen, you need to be here with the Christians, with brothers and sisters, so that we can experience the joy that the Lord talks about. There's a drawing of joy that comes about, you know. 
in the fellowship, in the presence of Christians as well. In your home fellowships, in your other fellowships that you have, listen, there's a joy that comes about when you fellowship with other Christians. Not just only with the Lord. We need our fellowship with the Lord and with other Christians. Can someone say amen to this? Amen. Hallelujah. And then the third way I want to talk to you about how can joy comes, come into our lives, come back into our lives. You see, many of us will realize this. When you first came to the Lord, one of the things that was evident in your life is joy. Amen. Think about when you first came to the Lord. Maybe it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The first thing that came into your heart was joy. And it lit up your face. You know the story about the woman at the well. When she discovered the Lord, this is the Messiah. What, the, what does the Bible say? It says that she left her water pot and she went and spoke to everyone in her community. Why? Because her life was transformed. By living waters, amen, the joy of the Lord is so important. It lights up our countenance. She had a message to speak to people. So when you come to the Lord, it gives you joy. And that joy is so that you can propagate and share about the love of Christ. In Luke's gospel, it speaks about, Luke 15, Jesus speaks about the joy in heaven. Remember one of the stories, there are three stories there in Luke 15. One of them is the prodigal son, about how this son was repentant and he came into the fellowship of the father and there was a big celebration. And Jesus equated this with, with what would happen in heaven. Okay, so there are two verses I want us to see here. Luke 15, verse 7. Luke 15 and verse 7, and then Luke 15, verse 10. 7 and 10 is basically about the same thing. Jesus said, there is joy in heaven. There is rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. There's more joy in heaven when one sinner who repents than over 19. And, and again in verse 10, in verse 10, it says, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, when someone comes to the Lord on the earth, when someone gives his heart, repents and gives their heart to Jesus, what happens? There's a big celebration. There's a big party going up there in heaven. So this joy is many times felt Felt by who? Felt by the one who is born again. Felt by the one who is changed. But also the one who brings that person to the Lord. Amen. So people, the third thing or the third way we can have joy is simply this. Bring someone to Jesus. Amen. Just like the woman in the well. She came and told the message. She spoke to the entire community about who Jesus is. He is truly the Messiah. There's joy bubbling up in our life. And this, listen, this is one of the reasons why so many Christians are not experiencing that kind of a joy that the Bible speaks about. When was the last time you spoke to somebody about Christ? When was the last time you shared the gospel to somebody else? And so it's very vital for us people. Listen, you need to redig this joy once again on the inside. Dig up this joy by sharing the gospel. Telling somebody else, listen, this is what God has done for my life. You begin to build a bridge. You begin to tell them about who this Jesus is. And they come into the family of God. Amen. They come to know who Jesus is by the life that you lead, by the message that you speak to them. Listen, these are ways that God has put joy into the family of God, put joy into the system of the church. So if we, if we are not doing what he tells us, that's why joy is absent from our lives. All right, so get these things back into your life. Get these things back into your Christian walk. 
We cannot live without it. You see, the Christian is supposed to live out the life that Jesus commanded. Amen? And so these three vital things are supposed to be part of our lives, your everyday life, in that coming to God's presence is supposed to be a joy. Amen? It's supposed to be something that we participate, not just spectate, not just as a spectator, but a participant. Hallelujah. If you want joy, you must participate. Come into God's presence. Secondly, fellowship. Everyone say fellowship. It is different from friendship. Yes, we have all kinds of friends in this world. But listen, if you want to fellowship, if you want the fellowship of the Lord in your life, here is where you can have joy. Because it wells up from the inside. It's not something that you're seeking from the outside. It's something that comes on the inside. Amen. And the third way is tell somebody about Jesus. Next time when you come to church, bring somebody, somebody along. Amen. Let these empty chairs be full. Let them come to hear about the gospel. Let them come to hear about the living Christ so that your joy can be made full. Amen. What they experience as joy will also be your joy in life. Amen. Come on, let's all be upstanding this morning. I'm trusting that this word this morning will, will be an integral, important part in your life. That joy should not leave a Christian. You cannot leave a Christian or lead a Christian life without joy. One of the marks of the early church was joy. One of the marks of someone who is vibrant in faith is joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I invite the musicians, the worship leader? Do you have any songs with joy in it? <laughs> Shout for joy. Hallelujah. Okay. Do you know that song, Make a Joyful Noise to the Lord? You got sung that song once. Shout for joy, hallelujah. Come on, respond, congregation. Let's shout for joy, hallelujah. It's not a performance, amen? Those of you who are standing, come on, at least make some moves. The last time I did this in the church, they said, you've got to be very careful with the flooring. But uh, there's no problem with the flooring today. It's not wood. 
Amen. You won't go through. So come on, just make some moves and make some shouts. Lift up your hand. Declare. Amen. Speak out. Come on. Let's start again. Come on, SLA. You are not dead silent. Hallelujah. Give a little shout. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Woo! and with shouts and celebration, you know, there's a liberty that comes about. Amen? Amen. If you came with a headache, if you came with pain, if you came with sorrow, it all has to leave. Hallelujah. Because it's either joy or these things. When joy is present, these things dissipate. These things disappear. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Before I... Before I Come down. Let's just lift up your hands. Let's, I just want to pray a prayer over your life. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, even as we heard about this message, I'm praying, God, that this word will not depart from our lives, from our lips. I pray, God, that we will activate joy each time we come into your presence. It will not just be participating in the services, but to get involved to be a part of the congregation, to be a part of our people. And Father, let us be acquainted with the joyful noise, not only on a Sunday, but every day of our lives. And the scripture says that we walk in the light of your countenance. And that simply means that your favor will rest upon us. 
when joy is present, your favor is present. And I'm praying, God, that you will cause us, Lord, to tap into this favor every day of our lives. And I'm praying, Lord, for your children, even this day, to experience abundant life, to experience joy and peace and love and blessings and supply from heaven. So, Father, this morning we pray, God, that this joy will continue to well up from our lives, will continue, Lord God, to be drawn up and drawn out. Lord, that it will be in our lips, it will be on our countenance, it will be, Lord God, in every of our actions, that joy will truly be a part of our lives. And thank you, Lord, that this church will be known, Father, for its laughter, for its joy, for its anointing, Lord, that liberates and sets free because they know the joyful sound in this place. Thank you, God. Father, we just commit our lives to your fresh, this congregation. May you bless us and let us go in your peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a big clap. Amen. Francis, remember, joy is only come in the presence of God. Fellowship, open your house for self-group. Self fellowship, a whole a fellowship meeting, huh? Don't uh, close the house because that is the joy. In the world we have sadness, in the world we have regrets, but in the presence of God, in the fellowship, in, in sharing Christ with people, that is joy. Remember that, brothers and sisters. Don't uh, close your house. Amen. Uh, we have cell group every Friday if you can, and offer your homes for cell group. Amen. Let the joy of the Lord be in the house. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let the praise, uh, let the grace of God. Let the love of Christ be with you. And let the fellowship of God be with us forever. And Lord, let me, we ask you to bless and bless your people. Keep them safe, Lord. Lift up your countenance upon them and let your face shine upon them. Let the peace of God and grace of God be with us forever and ever. We thank you. And come back again, brother and sister, for another time with God next Sunday. In the name of Jesus, we ask you. May God's people say, Amen. Amen. You need any Amen. prayer request, come, come forward. Your lack of joy, so come forward. So the pastor will pray for you so that you will be liberated. Amen. God bless everyone. Blessed Sabbath for everyone.